information on the worship handout carrying along with you throughout the week. We do make that available through an app called YouVersion Bible App. It's a great resource, digital Bible. Take it with you wherever your phone is. Um, but the whole thing is there underneath the events portion. Romans chapter 7, beginning at verse 18. The Apostle Paul is speaking here. Oopsies, one moment. All right, verse 17. As it is, it is no longer I myself who do it, but sin living in me. For I know the good itself does not dwell in me, that is, in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I want to do, this I keep on doing. Now, if I do what I do not want to do, it's no longer I who do it but it is sin living in me that does it. So I find this law at work. Although I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For in my inner being I delight in God's law. But I see another law at work in me, waging war against the law of my mind, making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within me. What a wretched man I am! Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? Thanks be to God, who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then I myself in my mind am a slave to God's law, but in my sinful nature, a slave to the law of sin. We'll get into this in a little bit. First, I wanted to reflect on something I heard. There were some young 20-somethings reflecting on their high school experiences. Uh, this guy named Robert, he was thinking about what it was like in high school and how hard it was. He never quite fit in, never quite got along, and um, this one time when he was at camp, and he was in, in the bathroom. Somebody came up behind him, and a couple guys, they picked him up, and they tilted him upside down, and they dipped him in the toilet water. Thankfully, it had just been flushed, but still, gross. He used that one little example just to illustrate how many different ways he suffered through high school. People didn't care for him, they didn't like him, and they did that regularly, things like that regularly in actions, and, and they just bullied him nonstop. He was at a Christian school. As he reflected in his 20s, he thought to himself, why would anyone want to be part of an organization or a religious body that has very little impact on its followers? Rebecca was in that same conversation, and she chimed in as well. She talked about her high school experience in kind of the same way, except not as physical. It was more with looks and more with words, things that you wouldn't really want to say any other time of the week. But they got just lambasted on her, verbally, and also with notes, and also with messages. And she had this horrible self-esteem about herself, that she was just worthless and garbage. And she said she worshipped with many of these same people on Sunday mornings. Why would anyone want to be part of this thing called Christianity when its followers are so horrible? A whole bunch of hypocrites. This wasn't just these two people that, that experienced something like that. Um, you can look at the survey from last year, Barna Group. That's pretty small on the screen. But at least you can tell there's three spaces there. Christian, other faith, no faith. They surveyed the Barna Group. They survey everybody. 13 and older, that they can get a hold of, a sample group. And the top two would lead Christians to question their faith. The first one was human suffering. We've already covered that in a sermon series, so you're good on that, right? The second one, the hypocrisy of religious people, would lead them to question their faith. If you go over the next category, if people are in an other faith category, non-Christians, but still of a faith, they would say the number one thing that would lead them to question their faith, the hypocrisy of religious people. The number one thing of people who are outside of any religion, they just, they, they don't practice anything, they're not part of any organiza organized faith. The number one thing, 42% of them, almost half of them, the hypocrisy of religious people would lead them to put a hand up, now I want to hear it, because I've seen the way you people act. Is that surprising? I, I don't think so. I don't think so. Maybe even some of us have our own stories we can tell about some of the hypocrisy 
we witnessed or we did. It's, it's really important to understand that this question that's, that's surfacing today, why are Christians so, such hypocrites or filled with such hypocrisy, um, how that relates to us. Because in reality, this little statement that pops up again and again, perhaps you've already heard it, you may be the only Bible someone reads. Like, somebody is not going to want to check out Christianity and just pick this up out of the blue, normally. Sometimes it happens, but normally. They will be looking to people who are practicing this or carrying this around or going to buildings like this and talking about things that are in this to see what it's all about first. Kind of like window shopping. If they see something different about you, they're going to want to find out more and then maybe they'll get into something like this. You may be the only Bible someone reads. And unfortunately, we've been representing a lot of hypocrisy to the world. That's a big representation. Um, that's, that's a big big representation in, in those surveys that were on the screen. But first, I guess we should understand what hypocrisy means. Do you know that word, the etymology of it, where it comes from? Greek word? That's okay. It's play acting, or just acting. So if you are called a hypocrite, it goes all the way back to when somebody was standing on a stage and doing a playwright pretending to be someone else. Play acting. And it, it, it has come to mean a little bit more than that. It's, it's come to mean like when you are really ridiculing someone and you're really, really um, tearing them down for something they did that was wrong, when you yourself are doing the very same thing, you're being a hypocrite. Or when you are pretending to be something that you really are not. Hypocrisy. This is what the world thinks Christians are like. How do you feel about that? How do you respond to something like that if somebody comes up to you and says, ah, thanks for the invite to church, they're all a bunch of hypocrites? That's what we're tackling today. Keep watch over yourselves and all the flock. Paul said, savage wolves will come in among you and will not spare the flock. Even from your own number, men will arise and distort the truth in order to draw away disciples after themselves. This is a note that says, Hypocrisy has been around from the beginning of Christianity. When Paul was going on his mission trips all, the way on, all around the place, and he was sharing the gospel, and then he had to leave to go to another church, he knew, he knew, there were going to be people who were going to come in, and they were going to play act. And they were going to present things that were said to be from Christ, but not from him. And they were going to lead people astray. Because this is something that Christ said was going to happen. He used a parable of a field. Anything wrong with that wheat field? Yeah, those beautiful green things are not supposed to be there. Those are weeds. They bring the value of the wheat down. They cause the wheat to be not quite as productive. Jesus told a parable and he said that a certain farmer, he went out and he sowed seeds in his field and the wheat was, was uh, germinating and then in the middle of the night when the farmer was, was away, the enemy came in and just because he's a stinker, he threw weeds all over the place. So that as everything started to germinate, it looked like there was a lot of wheat there, but there was also something else coming up. So the workers said, should we go out and should we um, clean up this field? Should we go and pull all those weeds? And the, and the farmer said, no, don't do that yet. Don't do it yet. Because if you're pulling up the weeds, you might inadvertently stomp out some of the weeds or pull out some of the other wheat. And, and we don't need to do that now. There'll be come a time of harvest when we will thin out the weeds, but not yet, not now. Paul experienced it. Jesus promised it. There are going to be people who are Christian who are not Christian. So if somebody says Christians are all hypocrites and I experienced some horrible things from some people who were Christians when I was growing up, you can tell them some Christians are not Christians. You can empathize with them. You can apologize for their experience. But you can say, look, maybe who Robert and Rebecca were rubbing shoulders with, they weren't actually Christians to begin with. They were just there because they were forced to be there. They were just there to get something out of whatever the situation was. That is a reality. Christians are hypocritical sometimes because they just aren't. Scary thought. There's more. There's more. 
I could not address you as people who live by the Spirit, but as people who still are worldly, mere infants in Christ. You're still worldly. For since there is jealousy and quarreling among you, are you not worldly? Again, Paul's talking to one of these churches that he planted, and he had heard news about some of the things that they were doing against each other. In this loving community of blood-bought sinners, they were jumping down each other's throat, quarreling, arguing, fighting. doesn't say exactly what they were fighting about. Maybe it was money. That's usually an oftentimes thing people fight about. Maybe it was what somebody said or didn't say. Regardless, it was inappropriate for God's people. So Paul calls them infants in Christ. Important to note, they were in Christ. They were believers. They were followers. They were saved. But they were just babies. And they weren't maturing and growing like they were supposed to. So if somebody comes to you and they say, it's, people, Christians are all hypocrites. Well, some Christians are hypocrites and are immature. Really immature. And I'm sorry for what you experienced. There's no excuse for it. But they're just, they just weren't there yet. I think maybe even think back to our own youth and some of the things that we said or did against those who were in authority, teachers or parents, or maybe we were some of the bullies. Uh, Think about some of those things that happened when we were immature. Yeah. It leaves a bad taste in a lot of people's mouth, including us. And that's where it gets really scary. Because... Think about now your own life. Where do you fall? Are you in the immature category? Or are you in the spiritually dead category? It leads you to question, at least, is that possible, given what I've seen in my own life? That's what we heard in Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 7. I don't understand what I do. For what I want to do, I don't do it. But what I hate, that's a strong word, but what I hate, I do. This is the desire to, to, to say, oh God, I, I hear what you say and I think it really makes sense and I want to do this. And then all of a sudden Monday rolls around and it's gone. Because, because of what they said, because of what I heard, because of how I'm feeling, because I'm tired, because I had too much sleep, because I got too much work, because I don't have enough work. These little temptations, they spring up. And it leads somebody, even like the Apostle Paul, the Apostle Paul, he, he met Jesus on a road. He was preaching in church after church, starting tons and tons of missions. And he says, I hate what I do. When I don't do what I want to do, I sin. He, can, he continues, he says, I know that good itself does not dwell in me, that is in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. Notice that he's changing the I, or it's almost like he has a split personality. Like, I know that good itself does not dwell in me, my sinful nature me. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I, the sinful nature me, cannot carry it out. He's expressing something that we all have in this world, that as we've been called to Christ, still clings on to us. I'm talking about that sinful nature that when we wake up and we have the greatest aspiration, we have the checklist all made out, and we're going to have these these great things in our life, and it's going to affect everyone in the world. We're going to make this world a better place for you and for me and the entire human race, like the song goes. And then it disappears. And And I can't do it. And I'm frustrated. And I'm angry. I have a sinful nature. Paul says that. If he can say that, I think we all can say that. He continues, if I do what I do not want to do, it's no longer I who do it, it's sin living in me that does it. He's not passing the buck. He's saying, this is part of me that still stinks, that still is rotten. It still is selfish and controlling and angry and afraid and broken. That's me. That's me. You think you'd get to a point now where that wouldn't be an issue, but it's me. What a wretched man I am. 
Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? You get to the end of it and you just say, ugh. It almost wants you to throw up your hands and say, I give up. I can't get rid of this. It just keeps bothering me. I just can't get through it. It's not going to work. Fine. I give up. I give in. But that's not what he does. He's making an acknowledgement that his sinful nature is there. But he also knows that there is support and there is help. All Christians know that there is a need for a Savior and who that Savior is. When I'm wrestling with myself, when I'm frustrated and disappointed with my lack of action or things I should never have done, I go to my Savior and I lay it all out there. I'm not excusing it. I'm not saying it's a good idea. But I'm saying this is the reality. In this world, we still have this sinful nature that walks right alongside of this new person God created in us and sometimes gets the best of us. If it was able to master someone like Paul at certain times, it gets to us too. It's important to know what to do with it. You know what that's like though, right? Have you ever um, been on a river, on a tube, floating down? I know we don't have too many rivers and I don't know if you'd really want to float down our river. Meet new people that way. Um, yeah. It's pretty fun. Have you ever instead of laying back on that tube, flipped over on your belly and tried to paddle around and go upstream? Even if you're in a gentle going down river, when you turn around on your belly and you start to flail to try to go upstream, you start to realize how strong that current really is. Even though you're going pretty, pretty slow, you can barely move, barely make any headway. I think that's kind of what it's like, what Paul's acknowledging here. When that new person is created inside of you, and all of a sudden you turn against your sinful nature and you start to wrestle against the temptations of your heart, it hurts. You start to realize how much it's been pulling you and pulling you down. But again, that's not a reason to give up. Paul doesn't give up. He says where his help really is, right? Thanks be to God! He delivered us through Jesus Christ, our Lord. He delivered us. I know there are going to be times when I fall. I'm not excusing it. I'm not saying I'm planning to do that ever again. But I do know when it happens, I know who I'm going to run to. Because there's strength there. I trust that. There is strength there to endure and to make that long, arduous trip upstream. That's what we get to do. Thanks be to God. He delivered us. The old NIV said, he gave us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Christians are defined by Jesus' finished work that declares us as forgiven. Although we would like to dwell on those times where we have ourselves been the hypocrites, we are defined by who he has made us to be, a blood-bought sinner. The term for it's kind of crazy. We are at the same time saints and at the same time sinners. Simul justus et peccator. If you do it with your fingers, it's really cool because it's Latin. We are same time sinners and saints. We are the ones who are every day coming back to the cross saying, God, I did it again. And God, I'm so thankful your grace covers over all that mess. And I'm refreshed and I'm restored I'm going back at it. It's a lifelong process, for sure. But this is what he says about you. You're a chosen people, a royal priesthood, God's special possession, that you may declare his praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. That is who you are. That is whose you are. So, somebody comes to you and they say, I don't really want to go to church. I don't really want to be part of Christianity at all. Because there's a lot of hypocrites there. What do you say? Thirty seconds. Discuss with a friend. What do you say?
I gave you three things in the sermon. You could use those. If you have something better, that's good too. What would you come up with? Somebody says to you, there's a lot of hypocrites in church, in Christianity, it's not for me. You say? Come learn about Jesus. Yeah, that's a good one. Another one? What's that? At times, so am I. I appreciate that. Because notice in the responses that I shared, and not a, I never denied that. The Bible doesn't deny that. Unfortunately, you know, there are moments where we do sin and, and we give Christ a bad name. We can't approach other people like their sin is worse than our sin. We're on the same page be, be, be before a God who has died for both of us. Cool, cool. Sorry, I don't want to take over again. Other thoughts? Anything else you heard you liked? Yeah. Yeah, they're pointing the finger at the wrong place. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 <laughs> right? Yeah. 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 Yeah, sin corrupts indefinitely. And yet, as much as we want to wrestle with ourselves or wrestle with each other, the best spot to come is before a God who forgives and restores and rebuilds. And we go. One, maybe it's a little snarky, I don't know, response that I like to give is, there's always room for one more. There's too many hypocrites in church. Well, there's always room for one more. Come check it out. 9 a.m., Riverside, 5939 Magnolia Avenue. Come on over. Fun stuff. There's a lot of good questions that come up from people. Don't be scared if somebody has a question when it comes to faith. Don't be scared of that in their conversations with people. Because when they ask questions and maybe you don't know the answer, that's where learning happens. And then you can dig in. And we're a resource for you. And God's word is here and it's very much available. So don't be afraid. If somebody calls us all hypocrites because we are forgiven, we are loved, we are restored, and we are growing. Amen. Let's join in confessing our faith with the words of the Nicene Creed. This ancient statement of what we believe God's word says about him. I invite you to please stand as we confess our faith in our triune God. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen.